Uh, my name is John Eichert. For those of you that don't know me or haven't heard of me, I'm a retired agricultural economist. I'll speak a little bit more about my background as we go through the, the presentation. Um, but I spent the first half of my academic career as a very traditional academic agricultural economist, and I've spent the last 30 years or so, 20 years since I retired, um, and as an advocate for sustainability with the emphasis on agriculture and economics, being an agricultural economist. So what I want to talk about today in respect to this conference is probably I would call kind of the big picture concept of how what's going on at this conference and what's going on at dozens if not hundreds of other places around the country. They kind of fit into the bigger picture of the food system and the future of food and farming as I call it. The battle that I'm talking about is between two different visions for the future of the food system and the future of farming. And I'm convinced that today we're in a time of great change. You know, sometimes it's been said that the only constant in life is change, and that's true. Life is, is always changing. Living things are always evolving. But there are some changes that are not usual and ordinary. There are some changes that are truly revolutionary. I'm old enough to have lived through one of those revolutionary changes in the system of food and farming, and that was what I call the industrialization of agriculture, the industrialization of the food system. That transition began shortly after, it began a long time ago, but the, the major sort of movement, the seismic movement occurred after World War II with the introduction of the technologies that were developed for warfare, specifically the munitions plants that developed uh, munitions for the war were turned into nitrogen fertilizer plants and the, the chemical warfare was turned into pesticides and the factories that had been producing tanks and jeeps turned to producing cheap farm tractors and we basically transformed agriculture in a very short period of time. We went to what I call the industrial model, which is from diversification to specialization, then standardization, routinization, mechanization, simplify the management process, consolidate into larger and larger operations to achieve economies of scale. It's what we did in industry. It's what we did in agriculture. Um, it was the technologies that made that revolution possible, but it was the change in government policies in the late 60s and early 70s that made that transformation inevitable. But where do we go in the future? I would contend that there's a growing public awareness and admission that that industrial model of agriculture that we developed while well intended is not sustainable, meaning we can't continue doing it. It's not ecologically sound, it's not socially responsible, it's not economically viable. Change is no longer, in the longer term, simply an option. It's an absolute necessity. I've come to the conclusion that people don't make big changes like this, revolutionary changes, unless there's three conditions in place. One, we have to become convinced that what we're doing isn't working and isn't going to work in the future. It's easier just to keep doing the same things you're doing, and change is always risky and it's always uncertain. The second thing you have to have, even though you think the current situation can't work, the second thing you absolutely need is you need a vision. You need a, 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 an idea of what would be possible instead of what you want to change to. You can feel a need to change, but if you don't know what to change to, then you don't have the ability to change. You don't know which direction to turn. That's the second. The third condition you have to have for fundamental change is you have to believe that it's possible to get from here to there. And that's kind of what I want to outline the rest of my sort of presentation. And I plan to leave roughly half of the time that we've got left, at least, for questions and answers and discussions. So if you kind of let me tell my story and then we'll come back and we'll have time to discuss any questions as I get through with that and I kind of finish laying this out. If you want to see kind of the growing public awareness that something's fundamentally wrong with the food system, then go online and Google 
the name of any of the major newspapers and then Google industrial agriculture, industrial food system, factory farms, CAFOs, whatever, in conjunction with that newspaper and it'll come up and it'll show you a whole series of articles, whether it's the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Des Moines Register, uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, any of them particularly out in the middle of the country. And practically every one of those articles where you Google factory farm, industrial agriculture along with it, will be talking about the problems, the environmental problems, the animal welfare issues, public health issues, climate change issues, across the board, growing public concern, and it's reflected in the major newspapers because those papers, they cater to what the public is interested in. They tend to know that. And you'll see stories about transition in animal agriculture for cage-free or, or crate-free or antibiotic-free animals. You'll see concerns about genetically modified organisms and the use of pesticides and so on in the crop production and the growing concerns and the environmental risk associated with that. And, and those concerns, those public concerns, are well documented in science. I'm not going to go down and make the whole case against industrial agriculture here because I think most of the people here understand it, but I want to mention just a few of the things to understand how strong that case is. If we look at environmental issues, for example, the EPA identifies agriculture as the number one non-point source pollutant of our streams, the lakes, uh, wetlands, estuaries, things of this nature. It's a major contributor to pollution of the groundwater and depletion of the aquifers. You can look at industrial agriculture, agriculture in general, our dominant agricultural system is a major contributor to climate change. You see various estimates, but somewhere around 15% or whatever is associated with agriculture, not include the clearing of lands and things of that nature. Um, you know, and you hear that's about in the line with the overall transportation. You hear real challenges now to even the future of animal agriculture in order to mitigate climate change. If you look at public health risks, probably the thing that's getting the greatest attention now is the glyphosate or Roundup has been associated, identified by the World Health Organization as a probable carcinogen. I understand there's some retraction and things on this, but they're still winning the court cases around the country against against Roundup, the people have been exposed to it in the big lawsuits. Antibiotic resistance is kind of a growing public health risk all around the, the country, threatens our, the effectiveness of antibiotics, which is accountable for basically the most important public health advancement of the last century with a disease called MRSA, most people are familiar with, is resistant to bacteria. And scientists around the world, if you read from CDC, they say scientists around the world have compiled compelling evidence that links growing antibiotic resistance to the routine use and routine feeding of antibiotics in the large confinement animal feeding operations. The World Health Organization has come out recommending strict prohibition or limited use of antibiotics, but only for treatment, not for prevention of disease. A special summit of the heads of states in the United Nations come together on the focus of antibiotic resistance, identified industrial agriculture, basically the large animal feeding operations, as contamination of the soil, the water, the food system with antibiotic resistant bacteria. The evidence is strong, straight across the board. People argue, you know, when you go into places like rural Iowa, where I live now, they say, well, it, we've got to have this. Uh, we say Iowa is agriculture country. It's the, the rural economy is dependent upon agriculture. And industrial agriculture is, is all we have in terms of economic development. But, but the statistics, the data show something fundamentally different. In 2008, the Pew Charitable Trust funded a two-year study that looked at various dimensions of, of large-scale animal agriculture. They called it industrial animal agriculture production. Conclusion of that with respect to the impact on rural communities. It said the communities that are dependent upon industrial agriculture and animal agriculture in particular have lower overall incomes, greater income inequity, higher rates of poverty, less business on Main Street, <coughs> fewer sales in stores, fewer stores in, in areas that depended upon this kind of agriculture. And rural communities, which had been considered good places to live overall, 
are now considered the, the, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal in 2017 come up with a report that, that called uh, rural areas or rural communities, identified them as the new inner cities. And they went down a whole list of scales of, of socioeconomic indicators in terms of poverty, uh, lack, of, uh, lack of higher education, teen uh, uh, birth, divorce, death from heart disease and cancer and other early, early uh, death rates, disabilities, unemployment. Rural areas now rank lower than the inner cities in terms of the overall socioeconomic scale. This has not been a, a rural economic development strategy. It's a rural economic desecration strategy. And our rural communities are suffering the consequence. And we're seeing that emerge in the political arena today. They tell us that industrial agriculture is essential for lower food prices. Well, we did have a reduction in the percentage of income spent on food between the 1970s and the 1990s. But for the past 20 years, food prices have risen faster than the overall inflation rate. Any savings we've had in terms of cost of production at the farm level has been more than offset by higher margins for processing, packaging, pre-preparation, a whole range of things. The food industry is using it, the farm output as cheap raw materials to put into junk food, that not only not feeding the poor, but it's making people sick in the process. Talk about feeding the world. We're not even feeding the people in our own country. We have more people that are classified as food insecure and hunger than we did back in the 1960s. 11% of people overall, about one in nine, are classified as food insecure in the latest statistics. One in six kids in this country, more than 16%, live in food insecure homes where they're not sure there's going to be enough food to get them through. Back in 1967, CBS did a documentary called Hunger in America. It starts out, it's still on a YouTube if you want to go look at it. It talks about people in America, the poor people, the hungry people, 10 million people, one in 10 million, one, one in 20 people at that time was hungry. And we called it a major kind of public concern. Today we've got, you know, one in six kids and people say, well, it's, agriculture is doing its job, we're producing cheap food. In addition to that, it's not only the cheap food that we produce, but it's the people that can afford, only afford to eat the cheap food. We've got an epidemic of obesity and heart disease and high blood pressure and diabetes and various forms of cancer that have been rising right along with the industrialization of the food system and now threaten both the physical and the economic future of this whole country. But we've got to feed the world, right? How often have you heard that? Industrial agriculture is necessary to have to feed the world. Again, it's simply not true. UN studies, various ones around the world, 70 to 80 percent of the people in the world today are not fed by industrial agriculture. They're fed by small family farming operations, more than half of those we would call subsistence farms. The information shows, again, research shows that on those farms, by following non-industrial methods, I'll talk about later on, agroecology, nature farming, permaculture, a whole range of these things, we can double or triple the yields on those farms without industrial agriculture. We doubled the yields on 70%, that's 140%. We could feed the world and do away with industrial agriculture rather than simply transform it. The rest of the world doesn't need and doesn't want our industrial agriculture system because they saw the impact of the Green Revolution. It didn't feed the hungry people, it simply allowed big farm operations to come in and take over the small ones and force them off of their land and then produce food for export to the wealthier countries while the poor people still stayed hungry and poor. So what we're seeing today, I would argue, is an indefensible agricultural food system when people look at the facts and more and more people are beginning to look at the facts and that's the reason you have growing public concern. I think it's indefensible even to the corporate operations that basically dominated in the large farm organization or the large farmers that are trapped within it. So what do we do about it? What do we change to? Well, there's two competing models, and here's where the two competing visions for the future come in. The one vision says that we can redesign, retrofit, uh, you know, re Re retrofit or re uh, somehow 
make this current system work. In other words, we can fix the industrial system. We can deal with the environmental problems, or we can deal with climate change, or we can deal with public health without fundamentally changing the system from this industrial, specialized, standardized, consolidated system. The alternative vision of the future is that we need a fundamentally different kind of agriculture, one that's not based on kind of the industrial mechanistic model, but that's based on a model of the farm as kind of a living organism, an organic, biodynamic, biological, ecological view of agriculture and, and, and farming as a, as a nurturing a living system rather than as a manufacturing process that extracts resources from the earth and turns them into something useful. I think the corporations realize, you know, the growing public concern and they're trying to move toward fixing the system that they have rather than abandoning it because they simply have too much tied up into it. Too much tied up into capital and too much tied up in their reputation, too much tied up in all of the promises that they've made. If you look at the big agribusiness corporations today, you go on their websites, you'll see virtually every one of them has a sustainability initiative. They'll have a sustainability sector within their companies. They're trying to at least create the illusion that they're addressing these problems and they're trying to deal with the various public issues that come up. They're trying to regain the public trust. At the same time, you'll find the agribusiness establishment is promoting a, a giant sort of public relations or propaganda campaign all around the country trying to convince the people that this system isn't so bad that really these animals are very comfortable in these operations and that you're using the pesticides or using them safely and so on. But I think they know that that's simply a holding action. They're trying to appease the public while they make a transition and hopefully make some changes that will satisfy uh, the consumer out here on the other end. And that campaign is sponsored by Monsanto and John Deere, Farm Bureau, a whole range of people that are defenders of industrial agriculture. But at the same time, you see big corporations that are in fact making changes in response to consumer demand. Tyson and Purdue, two of the biggest poultry operations, have gone to antibiotic-free poultry They've been working on it for some time now, but they're moving in that direction. They're trying to get ahead of the antibiotic re resistance sort of thing. Uh, Walmart and, and McDonald's both have gone to promises. They're going to cage-free uh, eggs in their operations, trying to appease the people that are concerned about it. They're promised to go to crate-free, where they take the hogs out of the crates, responding to the animal welfare standards. <laughs> we see the growth in organic food production as people become concerned about conventional food and turn to organic and now we see the big industrial operations now embracing organic now that they figured out how to fit it and shoehorn it into their industrial model so they're going to go in that direction trying to appease consumers as well. You see farmers across Iowa saying well we realize we have a water quality problem but we'll address it voluntarily if you just give us more money so we can go out and do these things. You know they understand they got a problem. And they're promoting the whole big idea on climate agriculture. They're promoting a climate smart agriculture, which is based on information technology, biotechnology, things of this nature. They're going around plotting all across the country, the soil types and the crop types and climate conditions and this sort of thing. There's a thing now called big data. That's these huge databases that are all owned by operations such as Monsanto and Bayer and people like this that basically control those databases, but they've got data now on all the farms, the big farms, the soil types, the characteristics of rainfall temperature and all of that. Because they're setting it up, they, their idea is that one of these days they're going to be able to, to farm these farms with machines that are run like robots and guided by drones and then they'll, modify, they'll control the whole system from some, some control center somewhere like they do when they control the drones out in the, the Middle East. And the corporations will control the data, the corporations will control the genetics, and so on. And we'll have the robots and drones. We turn our rural areas basically into agricultural sacrifice zones where we can spray anything we want and use anything we want because there's not going to be anybody that lives there anymore, just a few people in hazmat suits that drift in now and then to fix the equipment and monitor it. That's the end of agriculture. When I talk about the battle for the future of food and farming, I'm talking about for the future of farmers. I mean, if that's your vision of the future of agriculture, if that should happen to work, there's not going to be any farmers there. 
There may be food or, or what Michael Pollan would call, we may have some food-like substances because they may decide to just manufacture it and not even worry about nature. But anyway, that's the direction they're trying to go. If I had to characterize the two directions and basic strategies, I would say the one I'm talking about here is what they're trying to do is separate. They're trying to separate agriculture from nature, separate agriculture from people. We've got this toxic, harmful thing that we don't really know how to fix. The system is inherently in conflict with the, with the social and, the, and ecological systems within its function. So if we can isolate this agricultural system from nature and from society, then we'll reduce the problems in it. When you talk about hydroponic, what are we trying to do? We get, the, we get the crop out of the soil. We get it out of the climate. When you talk about genetic engineering, a climate smart kind of crops, what are we talking about doing? Make it immune to climate. Make it immune to what's going on around it. When we talk about dealing with the problem of, uh, of health risk associated with using pesticides, we simply let the machines and robots use the pesticides. We separate agriculture from people. It's what you're talking about with the industrial system. The competitive vision against that is totally indifferent. It says we have to develop an agriculture that can function in harmony, in support, in conjunction with, benefit from and benefit the natural ecosystems and the social economic systems within which they function. The alternative vision to fixing the industrial agriculture system is a fundamentally different system that, is, that functions and is productive, is ecologically sound and socially responsible because it works in harmony with nature and society and benefits from the natural productivity of nature and society. And we can call these systems organic or biodynamic or biological or ecological, sustainable, resilient, uh, uh, re regenerative permaculture, holistic management, nature farming. There's a whole range of them out here, but they all have that characteristic of, of reconnecting with nature and, and, and working with natural ecosystems, the natural regenerative capacity to, to sustain productivity over the long run. And they all work with in the social environment that meeting the needs of people, not just as consumers, but, but their needs as farmers, as members of society and members of community. There's a whole science that kind of embraces this whole range of alternatives for the future out here. And I think it's emerging more and more. It's already popular globally. I think it's coming more so here. It's called agroecology. Agroecology reconnects. Agroecology looks at the, at the living organisms and the life in the soil and the, and the plants and the animals above the soil and in relation to the soil and the, the farmer in relation to the plants and the animals and the, the farmer and the farm in relation to communities and community in relation. Society is all a part of the same living system, holes within holes, living organisms within organs within organs out into the, on out into the future. It's all interconnected. You know, from my personal experience, I first become aware of agroecology back in 1988. <clears throat> first conference I ever went to that was related to sustainable agriculture was an agroecology conference. It was at Ohio State University at that time, about 30 years ago, I guess, and a little more right now. And that was kind of the beginning of my learning about sustainable agriculture and where I am today, and I've continued since. You see, I spent the first half of my academic career, I got my PhD in agricultural economics in 1970, and the first half of that academic career I spent as a very traditional agricultural economist. I was out here promoting this industrial model, specialized, standardized. I was part of the get big or get out, you know. We had to have economies of scale. We had to turn farms into businesses. If it was a family farm, you couldn't let the family business get in the way of the farm business. That's what I'd been taught, and that's what I was teaching farmers. I was in an extension position out of working with the farmers. You see, I thought, it, I thought this was going to be good for everybody. First of all, I thought we were going to produce good food for everybody. It was about food security is the reason that we were involved in this. I talked about the government programs that changed in the, the late 60s, early 70s. This was all a part of it. The public universities transitioned over, too. 
food security. We were going to make good food affordable for everybody. And in the process, by giving opportunities to farmers to become more economically efficient, we'd create profit opportunities for the innovators, and they would be prosperous. And as a result, we would have prosperous rural communities as a consequence of that. It's going to be good for everybody. But it wasn't. Came along in the 1980s, and uh, we were gone through the 70s, which was a period of time of growing export markets and agricultural prosperity, similar to what we had in the early 2000s. And farmers were expanding, and farmers were doing what we so-called experts were doing. They were getting bigger and bigger all the time in order to take advantage of the growing export market and the profitability. And more than a few of those borrowed large amounts of money at high interest rates to buy more land, equipment, build more buildings, and various other things because we were going to be prosperous forever going into the future. Well, we weren't. We got into the early 1980s. We got into a domestic recession, a global recession. The export markets dried up. Farmers were caught with record high debts at record high interest rates and couldn't even make uh, interest payments on those loans. And farm foreclosures and bankruptcy were regular fare on the network news programs at that time. And more than a few farmers committed suicide when they lost their farm. You see, a farm wasn't just a business that you could pack up and leave. It was a way of life. I could see the consequences of that, and that wasn't what I started out to do. And it didn't work out like we thought it would, and I got to the point where I simply couldn't do that anymore, and I had to change. And thankfully, the sustainable agriculture movement was going on at that time, or just emerging from USDA, and I was able to get a, a grant from them to move from the University of Georgia, where I was a department head at that time, to the University of Missouri, to head up the sustainable agriculture program. And I've been, I've been at it ever since. But my first exposure was agroecology. was at that conference in 1998. I mean, yeah, 1998. But I didn't really become fully aware of how important this concept of agroecology had grown over the years until, surprisingly, I was asked by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations to write the, the, the report on far, family farming in North America in recognition of the International Year of the Family Farm. I was surprised. I said, you don't really want me to write that because, you know, most of the farmers in this country think I'm some sort of a heretic out here on the fringe, and they said that's exactly the reason we want you to write it, because we're really serious about the future of family farming. But I had an opportunity then to go and present that paper in Rome, and at that conference there was a group there called Via Campesino and others, and I could see there was a strong agroecology movement within there. There was a whole counter-global movement to this industrial agriculture movement that I became aware of, and it was kind of marching under the banner of, of agroecology. Agroecology has is, is basically evolved from kind of the early scientists that were involved in that first conference to become a, a way of farming, kind of putting it into a farming system, but then also into a social movement. As, as the science where it all started, what it does, it applies the science of ecology to agriculture. And the first principle of ecology is you can't do just one thing. Everything is interconnected. And that's the foundational principle. You can't do just one thing on a farm. Anytime you do one thing, you affect the whole farm. You affect the soil, the plants, the animal. You affect the community. You affect society. Effects may be small, some of them are large. But everything is interconnected. You can't take it apart piece by piece. You can't fix it a piece at a time. You have to fix the whole system. Everything that you do has intended consequences, but has unintended consequences, and you need to anticipate the possibility of that. Agroecology has evolved also into farming systems, and one of the characteristics of those farming systems, those interconnected systems, is it's respect for the, the nature of specific places, because natural ecosystems are different every place you go. The difference in the soil, the difference in the plant, the climate, everywhere you go from farm to farm to field to field is even different. But you've got bioregions, for example, that people are talking about distinctively different characteristics. And the agroecological farming system has to fit within nature because you're working in harmony with nature. 
But agroecology also suspects the, the social ecology of place. They recognize that farms and families are different in different communities. Different communities have different culture and different interconnectedness. The economic connections are obvious within the community because you're going to have to have customers for what you do, whether they're local or somewhere else. And every one of those markets with respect to the economy is going to be different. But every one of those social economies or every one of those social communities are going to be different. And the families and the communities and your connection and your place within the community is going to be a reflection of the culture of that community and the culture of relationships of people in that particular place. You can't replicate it like this industrial model, go out with best management practices, technology. It doesn't work because what works for one won't work for another. What works here won't work there. It has to be fitted to a particular place, which means that the farmer has to know the place. Has to, the farmer has to be a part of it, and the family has to be a part of a particular place in a particular community in order for that to work effectively. Some people question, you know, whether or not this is a realistic possibility. Is this a, there's some sort of a daydream out here? But the evidence out here is growing that it is a positive possibility, not just an idealistic vision, but it is a positive possibility. There was a recent 2016 report, which I think is a landmark report, put together by an international panel of experts on sustainability under the auspices of the Food and Agriculture Organization. And they're beginning by saying, the scientific evidence is overwhelming documenting the failure of the industrial system. And they go ahead and point out, sure, it increased overall production, but it's caused a whole range of negative externalities or side effects on the water and on the natural ecosystems, the release of greenhouse gases, the loss of biological diversity, increasing hunger, increasing malnutrition, obesity, disease, depression, loss of livelihoods of farmers all across the country, wherever the industrial model has gone. And they talk about there's an alternative system is available and there's alternative means that the research has been done and they're talking about agroecology with diverse natural ecosystems, diverse landscapes, replacing chemicals with, with crop rotations, integrated crop and livestock systems, restoring biological diversity, using holistic resource management and other things to sequester carbon, increase soil productivity, regenerate and renew the health of the soil, and provide livelihoods for farmers and farm families all across the country in these most depressed areas that need it the absolute most. Agroecology is involved into a, to a social movement also to replace this, and I'll talk more about it in the food sovereignty movement that's coming up. But it says, and, and again, this goes back to the IPES or this report I was talking about before. They point out that across the world that in the, in the developed countries that agroecological systems are competitive with the industrial system, maybe not higher input, but certainly competitive, but the most important thing is they have the potential of doubling and tripling yields and output in places of the world that need it most. And places that are most threatened by the industrial system coming in. They point out in this report that it's not a lack of scientific evidence regarding either the problem or the possibilities of replacing industrial agriculture. It's simply a lack of will to change agricultural policy to allow that revolution to happen. I would argue that we are farther along today in developing an agroecological alternative to the industrial food system than the industrial food system was in the 70s and 80s, I mean the 60s and 70s when we changed farm policies then. And that's what this report was saying. But they said the, the global food system is so dominated by the large multinational agri agri uh, agricultural corporations and the, the entrenched industrial agricultural establishment that they are the only things that are preventing those policy changes from taking place. We have two possible paths to the future. One is separate to, to separate agriculture farming from everything else and hope that it works out somewhere. The other is to integrate it. One is to fix, to mitigate, to minimize the connections, to minimize or slow the, the, the negative implications for society and for nature, and defer it until hopefully we come up with some sort of a magical technological fix. 
The other is the agroecology, to look in harmony with nature and mutuality, work in harmony and with nature and society to increase productivity and, and reduce and eliminate the negative ecological and social impacts on the environment. The question is, which path will we choose? I would argue that there's only path, one path, as I talked about before, that will include farmers. So if we're to win the battle for the future of farmers, we have to find a way to make this alternative system work. I think what we're talking about here, the, the challenge that remain is going to be remaining on the future. I think the, the winner of this battle for the future will be the one that solves the problem that the industrial system of agriculture failed to solve. I don't think it needs to focus so much. It's the environmental consequences, the other social consequences are there. But the fundamental reason to have agricultural policy, to have public policy of any kind, is to serve the public interest. And the fundamental principle that must underlie eventually all agriculture and food policy is to provide food security to ensure that everybody has an adequate supply of safe and wholesome food to support active, healthy lifestyles. That's what food security is all about. The industrial system failed to do that. That was the justification for it. It failed. The challenge to the alternative agroecological system is to meet that challenge. Thus far, and I've talked about this publicly in other places, the sustainability movement has focused most on meeting the needs of the future. Sustainability is about meeting the needs of the present without diminishing opportunities for the future. The greatest emphasis has been on ecological sustainability, focus on regenerative capacity for the future. There's been a reluctance for the sustainability movement and I think the agroecology movement to say our first responsibility is to meet the needs of the present. Until we meet the basic food needs of the present for good, wholesome, nutritious food, you're not going to get the public support we need to maintain opportunities for those of the future. And that's the challenge that we have to meet, to meet the needs of the future. I mean, to meet the needs of the present as well as the future. There's a whole global movement that the agroecology movement is supporting and is supported by, and that's called the food sovereignty movement. And the food sovereignty movement, and here's where I'll go to the slides. The food sovereignty movement at the bottom says, it starts off saying people's right to healthy and culturally appropriate food that's produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural system. That come out of an international conference in Maui, I think is 150 some countries come together and they said, what does food sovereignty mean after they had been working on it for more than a couple of decades? And they come through and they said, this is what it means. It means that people have a basic human right to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced in sustainable means and they have a right to define their own food system, place-based food system that meets their needs in their particular places. And it also goes on to say it respects the needs of those of future generations. Now, I think, and we can talk some more about this, I think the political system is working toward a system where we can possibly have these fundamental changes in our food policy and our agricultural policy and our policies across the country. I think the, the Green New Deal is, is, a, is an important statement in that direction. It's just a congressional revolution, resolution but it's supported by all of the major Democratic candidates. And the Green Revolution, I mean the Green New Deal starts off by saying, it is the duty of the federal government to create a Green New Deal that, and it goes down through here, secures for all people of all generations to come, clean air and water, climate and community resilience, healthy food, access to nature, a sustainable environment, and to promote equity and justice by stopping current, preventing future, and repairing historic oppression. It's a reaffirmation of people's right to healthy food, to clean air, clean water, healthy food, 
an appropriate place to live. But we don't have to wait for that. And that's what I want to spend a few minutes and then the rest of our time talking about. We don't have to wait for the big policy changes. There's things we can do right now. But we start with these realities. And I'm going to cover these quickly, and we can go back to them later if you want to. Markets are impersonal. They respond to scarcity, not to necessity. Most hungry people are, are people who are poor and can't compete for markets for food. That's a reality. Markets have never fed people and never will. That's the reason we have government programs. Market is hunger is a market failure. Justifies government assistance. Government programs have never been successful in eliminating hunger because they've also become bureaucratic and impersonal. There's no sense of connectedness between the people that are paying the taxes that support the program and the actual people who are receiving the benefits, or there's no sense of connection the people that feel the benefits, receive the benefits to the individual people who provide that. And I would argue that's the reason we have persistent hunger even with the programs. Many of the large charities have also become so impersonal and bureaucratic, and they depend upon corporate support for their food and various other things. There's a whole industry out here keeping people hungry because it keeps a lot of people employed doing various things. Local charities have always been necessary and will always be necessary to deal with you know, short-run emergencies, but they'll never get away with hunger. What I'm suggesting is a community food utility. Use the idea of a community food utility. It's time to try something new. The logical place to deal with food security is at the local level, in small communities, where the relationships are, are few enough and close enough to be a sense of, of being personal. We, we wouldn't have one in six hungry kids if we had to look those kids in the eye as they went home or came back to school on Monday morning. We would have a sense of caring that would be personal. It wouldn't be something impersonal out here. We wouldn't have hungry people. And the people who received the benefit, who knew who gave them the benefit, would be involved in this process and would, like, would work to change that. We don't have to change the law to have public utilities. We have public utilities for providing water, electricity, natural gas, sewer service, a whole range of things where we agree that we have to get together. Because if we don't provide those for everybody, if we don't say this is basic right to have this, you, you simply won't get it. Public utilities are a means of addressing market failure. They, they insulate public services from the market, but they basically establish some call a, a regular monop a regulated monopoly. You know, it can be a private investor utility, but it's regulated by the government. But they granted a monopoly. When I was growing up, you know, we didn't have electricity where I was. That's because it didn't make any economic sense to run that electric line, as we called it, down the road two or three miles for two or three families when your electric bill was probably 50 cents a month or something. We didn't have anything, a few light bulbs, even when we got electricity and electric refrigerator and toaster, and that was about it. So it didn't make any sense, but people said, those people have a right to electricity, and we're going to bring it down there to them. The reason we didn't have it, it didn't pay. But once you come in and give those local cooperatives, these are rural electric cooperatives, you give them a local monopoly, they hired local people to dig the post, they hired local people to put wiring in our house out here, and they made the whole thing work because they didn't have to compete with the other operations out here to make it work. Community food utility could ensure a right to food. You could say everybody in this community has a right to good, wholesome, sustainably produced food, and we're going to make sure that we get it. We're going to make sure that everyone has safe, nutritious, enough of it to support healthy, active lifestyles. We're going to have food security in our community. The realities of what we've... Okay, going the wrong way. So why choose food utilities as opposed to some other direction? The legal authority currently exists. You wouldn't have to have any new laws. You wouldn't require any new laws. They're commonly used in cases that are acknowledged that government intervention is necessary, but it isn't currently working. In other words, we already have government food assistance programs, which says that we have acknowledged that the markets aren't working here. And so we've instituted government programs to deal with this, but the government programs aren't working. So why aren't they working? I'm saying they're not working because they're impersonal. And so we have to get it back to the, to the local level. Uh, commonly used in cases of knowledge intervention, but necessary, but not currently working. Defend against labeling of right to food as communist or socialist. 
Uh, you know, I get that all the time. I say, uh, every time I say people have a right to something, they say, well, you're a, you're a communist. You say everybody has a right to something. I say, well, how do you like your communist sewer system? How do you like your socialist electricity? Does that work for you all right? And I'll talk a little more about rights here in a second. But anyway, um, history of successful use, I already talked about that. Uh, it's not limited to natural monopolies like I talked about before. Uh, probably what I'm talking about is more like a public transportation system. It's not that transportation don't, systems don't exist. Everybody has cars, there's taxis, whatever. But they say some people in the community can't afford those means of transportation. It's not accessible. So we'll have public transportation. We'll put in a bus system. We'll put in a train system that meets the needs so everybody can get where they need to go. Once you put it in place, then anybody can use it. The private systems are still there, but you have the public systems to meet a need within that. And that's what I'm saying about food. You still have food. Anybody can go get that, whatever they want to do, but your private systems work on that. Uh, you wouldn't be competing with private enterprise. You could allow people just like on the bus or on the train. You, you can say, okay, it's a public transportation system, but if you pay the full cost of riding it, you're paying the full cost. You're not, in, not unfair competition with anybody that's charging full cost for private service. So you can go ahead and do that, but it'd be available to all at full cost. Okay, what are some potential characteristics of these community food utilities? I suggest they'd be organized as vertical cooperatives. What I mean by that, we usually talk about producer cooperatives or processor cooperatives or something of this nature. Uh, what I'm talking about here is a cooperative that would include the people that were receiving the food, the people that were processing it, government agencies, um, you know, the people running the utility, farmers. You'd have local farmers that are producing food that would go into the utility. They would all be members of the public utility. They would all be represented on the board of directors. You wouldn't be a situation where you'd say, well, whoever has the greatest market power gets all the profit out of this system. You'd have a group that get together and say, here's what we pay the farmers, pay the farmers full cost of production plus a reasonable turn. Here's what, what it costs to the consumer. Here's what we get for the processing. You work all that out inside the system. Board of directors include all the people in here. Government food assistance programs, this is an important part of it. This is where the monopoly comes in. You would give this local uh, food utility the, the, the monopoly uh, authority to use government food assistance programs for any potential recipient that joined the utility, they could say, my government food assistance programs will go to the utility, and in return for that, they would get all of the safe, wholesome, nutritious food that they needed to support their families in return. It wouldn't be just a matter of getting a certain amount of food stamps that you send. You put your money in here, then you get your food security insured. And if there's a, a difference, we make it up somewhere else, but uh, be administrated, you know, good food system program. Here's where the key comes in. Priority would be given to the extent that you could possible focus on raw, minimally processed food, and which now amounts to only about 15% of what we're spending on food today. So even if you paid farmers more, even if you paid farmers twice of what they're getting out here somewhere else, if you can cut out half of that food processing, transportation, advertising by having local food, raw, minimally processed food, and the other part here is that you would take responsibility for helping the people know how to prepare the food, select the food, and take the food that's provided in here and provide good meals for their family. And you would create opportunities where if they were working too much somewhere else to have time, you could let them work in terms of the, of the food utility to prepare some of the food for themselves, to bring their families in, to learn how to cook. You could integrate the whole thing. I, people are hungry because we don't care enough. And what I'm talking about is creating a system within which we can show concern for each other and we can help build systems where people will be empowered to do things and go on and help other people as well. Food provides a means to fit the individual needs to the recipients. I think for the commercial food system, folks, we're going to go to home delivery here one of these days, and that's going to change the whole game. But you could start in here by people that can't get out of their home, but you could have a, a local market. I've got a group out in Denver, Colorado called Metro Caring that's in the process now of securing funds for a pilot project along this line. They're providing a free market for the people right now. They're concerned about future food supplies. They want to go to something else. You could have a local restaurant. You could have uh, home delivery, whatever people needed within that. Uh, recipients could be asked to contribute time and, and work to the common good, you know, to contribute to make the utility run. 
I was on a program out at Eco Farm a little over a year ago with a, a lady named Doria Robinson from the inner city of, uh, of Richmond, California. And she had worked with the low income people there, African American community there. <laughs> and they had turned an old railroad right away that run through the city of Richmond. They turned it into all raised bed and orchards and everything. <laughs> and the people from the community had built the raised beds and planted the orchards and put everything in place. And they were hired and involved in it. And she got up and said, my experience in working with people, you're never going to eradicate hunger by giving people money or giving people food. You've got to let them be involved in the process and contribute something in return for what they get so that they have some sense of dignity in what they're getting out of the system. Winning the battle for the future of food and farming. Once the needs of local insecurity are met, others could come in and pay full cost. I've suggested using something like community food utility dollars, where the people that were on food assistance didn't pay anything for them. Everybody else, other people paid full price. Some people paid part price. When you want to get the food, nobody would know who paid full price, who paid nothing. It would all be people coming together to eat together, eat the same food. As much local food as possible We cared for local farmers. You would pay farmers full production costs plus a reasonable profit. That's what public utilities pay to the suppliers of their coal or whatever they're getting. It goes through a process where they say this is what it costs to get it. This is a reasonable return to investors. You can do the same thing with farmers in here. You can develop alliances when you can't meet all the local needs at home. Develop alliances with other communities and then you can trade back and forth. But you know that you had sort of the same ethical commitment and the same commitment to ensuring the right to food with your community and their community and taking care of the earth and being responsible, sustainable producers of food. Communities that have food security choose various levels of reliance on their own food. Um, you know, growing political, I see growing political support in here uh, could begin to change the laws. One of the things we need to prove that something better is possible, convince people that it's possible to make the transition. If you can point to communities and say, here it's working. We don't have any hungry kids here. We don't have any hungry kids here. We don't have any hungry kids. We're not destroying the environment. It's a healthy environment. You talk about measuring nutrients like we're talking about this country, this community. You know, you could have people in the same community and some of them join the, the uh, food utility and they're getting good uh, nutrient-dense, healthful food and over a period of time. The kids are going to be healthier. The people are going to be healthier. You could have a control group of people that didn't join. You could, you could prove a lot of these things. You could prove that it was possible to change to something fundamentally different. Uh, okay, you begin to grow some political support, change the law. Future of food and farming, I think, is going to be bioregion, national, global alliances. Do away with this industrial food system. You just begin to get put together networks of communities to build bioregional systems and networks of bioregions to build national systems, global networks of local community-based food systems. You know, people say, that change can't happen that much. Well, folks, I lived through the industrialization of agriculture, and it basically happened in less than 50 years. Between the 1970s and the 1990s, in this country, we fundamentally transformed our food system. When I was growing up, we didn't have supermarkets. We just had grocery stores. You didn't get the stuff yourself. The people went behind the counter and got it and put it in a bag for you. We didn't have franchised restaurants. We were still farming with horses. Industrial agriculture was the old steam engine that pulled the thrashing machine from one field to another. We changed all of that in a period of 30, 40 years. Well, we can change all of this again. It can look totally different than it looks now. The relationship, to, I mean, the key to winning this battle for the future of food is relationships. Agroecology is about relationships, soils, plants, animals, people, society. Food sovereignty is about relationships among people and relationships with nature. Agri-food sustainability is about relationships with each other and relationships with the earth. The key to winning the battle for the future of farming is the integrity of relationships. That's my story. Thank you. Now it's time for questions. The rest of the time for questions, we have a microphone. I'm getting old, can't hear very well, so wait for the microphone, okay? There's some advantages to being old, but there's also disadvantages. The equipment begins to wear out. That's the most successful project I know around this model. It's metro carrying. I don't know of anybody else that's doing this. Now, every time you think that you come up with something nobody else is doing, uh, typically, you'll find, well, somebody already is doing that. I hope the heck I do. What's 
it's called met, metro caring, M-E-T-R-O-C-A-R-I-N-G, -E metro caring in Denver, Colorado. And they're working, what it is is the, I, I talked to the, the executive director out there uh, over, over a year ago. I, I talked to her out there, and she's very much interested in this. She's been studying for like two years. As I mentioned briefly, they have this fresh market, but they're getting mainly donated food is what's keeping it open. And she's saying, okay, as we go to reducing food waste and other things, their resources are getting tighter. And they're saying, how are we going to keep giving, how are we going to keep getting food, you know, for this? And they want to get really healthy food for them too. But anyway, so she said she had, had traveled different places and talked to people for about two years. And she said, I've listened to all of the different things that people are doing, and we've tried most of them. And she said that this is the first thing that I've seen that I think might have a possibility of really changing the game. And, and so I've been working with her since, but the thing was she was going to start on it, but then the person that she wants to lead it has been on maternity leave and just came back in October. But they have a corporation who they've talked to about it, a food corporation that, that uh, she feels very confident that they will fund it, and she thinks the local people in Denver are very much interested in this, and they would fund a pilot project. So if we could just get a start with a pilot project, she's got a community in mind that they'd like to go to, and there's a lot of local farmers around Denver that I think she could connect with, and there's different <coughs> groups out there. I've talked with different groups in San, San Mateo, California, Aspen, Colorado, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, various other people kind of interested in it, but that's the farthest one along. You know, I, you, you got to start somewhere, and it may or may not work, but, you know, my point is, is, is when you've got something you know is not working, why just keep on doing it? Uh, we know this system isn't working. And I'm pretty sure they can't fix it. But if they do, okay. But there's not going to be any farmers left. And, you know, my life has been about, I grew up on a farm. My brother's still on the farm I grew up on. Uh, I still believe in farmers. <laughs> yeah, and I see, but I think that political uh, system can be, can be changed. But first of all, there's lots of people out here that I think are really doing good things. There's a, there's a, a group of restaurants across the country that are called Everybody Eats. Uh, they have one in um, uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and they may be one in Denver as well. But you can go online again, you find all this stuff. It's called Everybody Eats, and it's kind of like the concept I was talking about with the community food utility dollars. Uh, nobody knows who's paying full price and who isn't paying anything. Uh, they come in and everybody eats, and some people pay full price and some people pay more. But it's, it's bringing community back together. So if you had a community food utility where, where you open it up to people to pay full cost, but they're paying full cost for their dollars that, that they spend at the utility grocery store or the utility restaurant or whatever. And there's other people who get them for free, but they all go eat together, and they get to know each other. So the, on the political issue, I think the landscape is changing. If you look at the, at the political, uh, the farm and rural platforms for uh, any of the major leading Democratic candidates, you see that, that every one of them supports the Green New Deal in some way. And you look at their farm policy. For the first time in my lifetime, and I was an agricultural economist, I've been following this since, actually since the 1960s in terms of farm policy. First time in my lifetime since that industrial shift in the early 60s, these candidates are coming out and saying, we need radical changes in farm policies, doing away with CAFOs and factory farms, doing away with GMOs, helping family farmers as opposed to industrial agriculture, taking control of uh, restoring competition in agriculture among the corporations and agricultural markets. You're seeing some really bold political initiatives. Now, I'm not campaigning for anybody, and I don't know that they'll win. But these are people that understand what the general public is thinking. And they've determined that there's sufficient political support for these views that they're willing to run on them. And that is a big shift. I don't know how many years it'll take to result in policy, but that's a big shift in political thinking. Yes. Yeah, and I think, I think uh, those are, you know, there's lots of, lots of good things going on. And I think, uh, you know, building the community and this sort of thing, the, the thing where I would see those kind of systems fitting in with this community food utility. That would become a part of it. And the farmers, the farmers would need to be, that are providing food and making a living farming, need to be on the board with people like you're talking about from this organization. And they have to understand that, that this is a public service. 
and all of the food that they can get into this system that meets the nutrition requirements and things like that at low cost or, or minimum cost reduces the cost of running this public utility. And they're still getting f food from farmers that they're paying the full cost of production because we want to, su we want to support this local farming <coughs> system that eventually has to expand out to serve the whole community and not just the hungry people. So the farmers have to be bought in to the public service nature of being involved in the organization. Otherwise, they say, well, it's, it's like you hear at the farmer's market. You know, sometimes pe uh, people are giving away food out of their garden, and so it depresses the market at the farmer's market. Well, in this, if you recognize it's a public service, you recognize minimizing the cost of that system is an important part of it. The, the other thing is, is uh, there's an interesting book called The Grocery Story that uh, written by, uh, I can't remember his name now, up in Canada, but he wrote, writes about groceries, but he's focusing on cooperatives. And one thing he points out in there that really drove home to me, he says, every time the cooperatives who are really committed to doing public service in addition to providing, like food, he's talking about grocery food, he says, every time they develop something that's innovative, that's really popular, because of the public service dimension to it, like they started the health food stores. Well, every time that becomes popular, then the corporate world moves in and pretends to do the same thing at a lower cost. And then they go into to organic, and then the corporate world moves in and provides organic at a lower cost, and they drive them out. So what I'm saying is we, if we establish this as a public service, a public utility to begin with, then the, the benefit of a public utility, it gives you insulation from that corporate world coming in and saying, hey, we can provide this food to four people cheaper than this utility is providing. We say, so what? This utility belongs to the community. We're not just committed to food. We're committed to the, taking care of the earth. We're committed to taking care of people. You know, it's a broader mission. And I think having a public utility protects you from being co-opted by the industrial world. But, and there's a, the next session, I think, uh, What's the lady's name? I was in her session yesterday, but the name slipped my mind. She's got a session on uh, using public banking basically to support the Green New Deal, which is exactly what we're talking about. I sent in her session yesterday. Her, her name's just slipped my mind right now. But set in on her session, and I think it'll go to that. I agree with you 100% about competition with the, uh, the, the, public, the private sector. I said not unfair competition. It would be competition. It would take a chunk out of their market but the people that weren't receiving government assistance would be paying full price. They would be participating and paying the cool cost of production. So you're not subsidizing people that aren't already subsidized by government payments. So, so you're providing competition, and ultimately you want to take the market away from them totally. Yeah, we need to, that, that's, a part of the, that's part of the change in foreign policy, is shifting the, cupper, shifting the, uh, the subsidies away from industrial agriculture, which we started back in the 70s and 80s and still do, and shifting that over to transition to a sustainable agriculture system. And Reggie's, I've t seen his presentation before, he'd be a part of that system. His product could feed, into these, could feed into these community utilities. You know, his product would probably fit the, the category, you know, would be re sustainably produced food in a socially responsible way that would go into the system. So I think it could all work, but I agree with you on public banking, but there's a session on that. I'm gonna go to it, see what I can learn. There, I, well, let me, let me give you the, the I'll, I'll do it very quickly, but full story. I, I understand why it come from and why it, you know, why it originated, and I think it needs to be done. Okay, so you're, you're saying the, uh, I, I'm on the board of the Cornucopia Institute, and I'm the board of policy advisor, not the board of directors, policy advisor, Cornucopia, and they've been fighting the battle for a long time, trying to maintain the integrity of the organic standards. Uh, and I wrote back in the late 90s, and I just found a paper I'm going to use another place where I said the, the, the basic problem with the national organic standards is once you developed a uniform national standard, you opened the door to this industrialization. You opened the door specialization, standardization. As long as the national food corporations had to deal with 15, 20, 30 different regional standards, it was very inconvenient for them. And, and they said, oh, we can't deal with that, so we're not going to buy from you organic farmers because you need to get together and give us a uniform standard. And so the organic farmers said this is the way to access the mainstream markets, which seemed like a lot of sense. But being an economist, <laughs> I could see this, specialized, standardized. Now you standardize. Whoever can meet the minimum written standard at the lowest cost can now take the market. 
and I knew that you couldn't write in everything that was embodied in true organic principles. Because I went back and read through it. Lady Balfour, and you know, one of the early ones in, in Great Britain, she wrote famously in a paper in a big conference, she says you can't uh, encode organic in a set of, set of rules. She says it's embodied in the outlook of the farmer, is the word she used. In other words, organic integrity is embodied in the farmer, in the land, in the whole thing that comes together. So anyway, so over time then, once you standardize it, then you could go to larger and larger operations because they could meet those minimum standards. They wouldn't have to have really healthy soil, just wouldn't use pesticides or fertilizers for a period of time. And you could mine this field and go to this field, or you can bring in compost from somewhere else and you can regenerate it. You don't have to have regenerative soil. That's just the beginning of it. But the thing that really brought on the other projects when they went to hydroponic, you know, you go to, you, you go to organic without soils. <laughs> To, to the old soils people, it's just organic is soil. It begins in the soil. How in the world can you have it? And other people say, well, we're not using inorganic inputs, so not using pesticides, whatever. It meets the rules. And then the other one was in CAFOs. I, I spent a lot of time with people fighting to protect themselves from CAFOs. New documentary out called Right to Harm. You ought to see it. It talks about the impact on people. Most people don't know, you know, what is it, two thirds of the eggs come out of CAFOs, half of the milk comes out of CAFOs, organic. Over well, 80, over 80% of the eggs. What's that? It's over 80% of the eggs. Is it 80% of the eggs now? And they tried to get in humane standards that would just give them the, the chickens a little more room. And I reviewed the economic impact statement on those organic standards. It would have affected 12 large producers, that's all. And they couldn't get it through. Uh, so it's still got suspended. Okay, so the real organic project come in and said, okay, we're, we're not going to compromise on those. We're going to develop real standards, and, and Dave here's the leader of that. We're not going to allow, uh, you know, CAFOs, and we're not going to allow hydroponics and things of this nature. We're going to try to protect the integrity of the organic label. And I think that's, a, that's important to try to get across to the public what you're doing here. But I think that the basic problem here, again, is if it's a uniform national standard, then eventually there will be something else that you didn't think of that's going to try to creep in. And you're going to, it's going to just be a continuing battle. They say, okay, it's not a CAFO, it's not technically defined as a CAFO, or it's not technically defined as hydroponic, but it, it really has soil. We're throwing some soil in the troughs below the... Uh, you know, in the water tanks, and so the roots get down to soil. So maybe it's a soil system, maybe it's hydroponic. We don't know. Uh, I, th that's the reason I'm I'm skeptical again. I understand why the real organic projects here. I think it's important uh, to call attention to what's happened to the organic standards. What I was on a cornucopia call, and what I suggest let's just let's just have industrial organic as a category out here. Let's just call it industrial organic. Uh, it's probably going to be raised in a capo if it's an animal product. It's probably going to be hydroponic if it's vegetables. Uh, but they won't have pesticides and won't be using chemical fertilizers. So if that's what you're concerned about, then go ahead and buy the industrial organic. And here's real organic. And if you don't want the capos and you don't want hydroponics, you don't want other things, here's real organic. So you can buy real organic. Or what I would add, if, if you really want to get serious about agroecology and integration with the land, then here's your local uh, organic label. Here's your, your bioregion, your community standards, whatever we call that. I've, I've even gone so far as to say, well, if, if USDA has the monopoly on the organic food label, why don't we just license organic farmers rather than the food? And so if we have local farmers, then I'm a, I'm a licensed organic farmer within my bioregion. And people know me, and they know how I produce, and they know I know how to produce organically, and you buy my products. And if it's got the local bioregion label on it, it's, it's only, we only buy from licensed organic farmers. Right. Well, it depends on whether you, you stick with the, uh, what agroecology really means. And I think the, the difference there, you do have a, a solid uh, scientific foundation, a, a whole history of research. You go to the University of California, Santa Cruz, and, and uh, people out there have been working on it for a long time. The Ohio State University 
had that first conference I talked about. They've still got agroecology people there that are doing, doing research, and they're doing research in other countries on it. The danger on, on agroecology, it's very much place-based. It's very much interconnected, which uh, sustainability and organic, uh, philosophically they are, but not in the way that they're defined. There's nothing organic here is organic here is organic over there. Agroecology is not. It, it depends on where you are. It has to be in, in harmony with the place. The, the real danger on all of these, and, and I mentioned it on sustainability, is, is if they ignore the, the social ecology part of agroecology. And, and this is what is so strong in the international movement, because in the international movement, agroecology in support of food sovereignty is local. It, it is a right to food. It is more a social movement than an ecological movement. It is a social movement that embraces the ecological approach to agriculture. And if, if we maintain that, then that's fundamentally different than sustainable agriculture has been interpreted, than in organic, regenerative agriculture. My concern here is that we talk about, okay, we're just regenerating the productivity of the natural ecosystem. Well, what happens to farmers? What happens to rural community? What happens to the rest of society? You know, we're moving toward a time when you go everything computerized and robots, what are people gonna do? I mean, we need to be talking about economic systems that provide opportunities for people to lead productive, successful lives where they have a, 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 the opportunity to use their imagination and creativity to connect with each other, to connect with the earth. I mean, our economic systems ought to be sustaining those kind of healthy social systems as well as ecological systems and giving everybody opportunities. That's what the Green New Deal says. It says you can't just address climate change by going out and cutting fossil energy and sequestering carbon. You gotta deal with the whole picture. That's what the Pope's encyclical on climate change or care of our common home. That's what the Pope said. He says we don't have two problems. We don't have an ecological problem and a social problem and a marginalized people. It's all the same problem. You're not going to solve one until you solve them all. That's what agroecology, I think, that makes it different. Can we keep it? I don't know. I think the strongest thing is to start at the local level. You can keep it there. You can't industrialize all of these different bioregions with different people, with different cultures and different values and different climates. You, it's just it's non-industrial. Uh, and it's very hard to control all that stuff. It's easy to control one national standard, one big grocery store. Yeah. Um, you, you have to go one step beyond local, though. I, I can get all the local pork you can think of in my home county because we've got, uh, uh, what is it, 160,000 hogs in my county, you know, 48 CAFOs or something like that. I don't know. Go ahead. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's got to be, yeah, go ahead. Well, to make sure the product's produced in a sustainable way. I'm saying I don't want to eat that CAFO the pig just because it's local. It's because it came from that farm that I can smell from my house. <laughs> well, if it's, a, if it's a public utility that's local, it is protected by law. It, that it, it is governed by the local people, and you, you have a right to do something. The way I've envisioned it here, your right would be to, to maintain those public funds that have been allocated to go to public food assistance. And, and you say, we give the sole authority to the local public utility to administer this program for those that choose to join it. For those that don't, they could continue to get the food stamps. And it's just like you have a, a, a public utility for a, a sewer system. You can't have a private firm come in and, and say, well, I can provide sewage treatment cheaper, so I'm just gonna take that over. I'm gonna go around and get all your customers. Uh, if that's a public utility, the, the only way they could get into control of that, and some people are selling water systems, is if the local government contracted with them to provide the service. And if you've got everybody in this system involved in governing that utility, then you're pretty sure that they're not going to sell out to a corporation somewhere. They, they could potentially hire a corporation to do all that stuff, but you have the right, the legal right, to say, no, I don't care if you can do it cheaper. We're doing it the way we want to do it. And that gives you that protection. On the, on the REA that I've talked about, I went back and read the history on that. At that time, if the public utilities wouldn't put, the private utilities wouldn't go into these rural areas. Uh, one thing they would have had to do, would, they'd have had to provide, uh, follow uh, federal labor laws and provide federal wages to people. 
Well, the people were so economically depressed in these areas, they were more than happy to get jobs going out and digging holes for these light poles and putting up light wires and wiring people's houses at you know, probably half the wages of what they would have paid, the utility would have paid in St. Louis or Kansas City. But they gave them the right to do things that they wouldn't have had the right to do because it was a public service that wasn't being met. And that's the, that's the philosophy behind a public utility. You can do things that otherwise wouldn't be allowed in the private sector because you're providing a legitimate public service. And the fact that we've been allocating money, government funds, for public food assistance for decades says that is recognized as a legitimate public service. And it is well known that it is not meeting the needs. So I think you can make a strong case for it. And the strongest case is to get the city councilman to talk to the teachers. I think you have to have an, an organization, kind of like I'm hoping this metro carrying organization, that really has experience and has credibility within the low income community and with the government. You wouldn't necessarily have to have that, but I think that's a, that's a good starting point. You have somebody that really knows how to work with people, they know the local government, to, to be the lead sort of organization that says, okay, we'll facilitate this process of engaging the community. And what we're talking about is engaging the community in a, in a discussion process, throw it, roll out the idea, get feedback from the, the potential recipients, get feedback from local government, involve local farmers. You know, it's going to be a, a, a long process. You can't just go in and impose this on top of people. So you need people that are used to working with people, and get input from them, get all these people together and say, here's the idea. And they may decide, well, we don't want to do it. Well, if they don't, try something else. I mean, uh, you, it's, it doesn't make any sense just to keep doing. The, 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 first, the first government food assistance programs were instituted after the enclosures. As long as everybody had access, common access to common land. If anybody had food, everybody had food. If you had hunger, everybody was hunger. You didn't have... I call it discretionary hunger, as we have now. Discretionary hunger came with the enclosures. Whenever they enclosed the, the land and made private property out of it, the idea was if we do that, then the better farmers will farm it, and there'll be more food and things. But there's always been people in every society, and there always will be, that even though we're all of equal inherent worth, we have differing abilities to produce anything that has economic value. Economic value is determined by scarcity, not by need, not by anything else. And there will always be some people among us, no matter how valuable they are as human beings, they just can't produce things that are scarce. And that's the reason we always had hunger. And so people that lost access to the land, they couldn't produce enough. So in 1602, the English put in English, what's called the English Poor Laws. And they'd never had government involved straight across the board. They'd always had charity programs that churches took care of. But for the first time, you had able-bodied people that were hungry. And we've been trying ever since. And so people say, or kind of imply, well, you ought to have the answers to this. Why, you know, is this going to work? Whatever. We've been trying this for 400 years. My gosh, you know, <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. So let's just get at it. Uh, do something different. I think whoever wins the battle against hunger will win the future of food and farming. That's my story. Thank you.